next speaker is Dr. Amy Wax. Uh, there are, I'm, I'm certainly a fan of her. She is a legal scholar and a neurologist. She is a professor of law at the University of Pennsylvania Law School. Uh, Dr. Wax's work addresses issues in social welfare, law and policy, and the relationship of family, the workplace, and labor markets. Dr. Wax has published widely in labor journals addressing liberal theory and welfare work requirements as well as, as the economics of federal disability laws. Her most recent book is Race, Wrongs, and Remedies, Group Justice in the 21st Century. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm welcome to Dr. Amy Laura Wax. Well, thank you very much. Um, I am really delighted to be here, uh, and I'm grateful for the invitation to your lovely city, which I've never seen before, and it really is quite beautiful. Um, I am, I've been allotted an hour, and I know from experience that I should not use it all, and I won't, because I want to hear from you. That's often the best part, uh, so I will try to be as brief as I can. So my talk today is quite pertinent to the title of this conference, in particular its morality part, as I will explain, but also the capitalistic part because the US is still kind of sorta a capitalistic country. And I'm going to speak from the American perspective about an ongoing conflict in, occurring in my home country, and I think that's echoed in other certainly in un uh, the Anglosphere, but in countries worldwide. And that is, what is happening in the world of education? And I would like to divide the world into public elementary and high schools, we call it K through 12, but then also higher ed, colleges and beyond to professional schools. Now, of course, this is a vast topic. So to try to narrow it a bit, I'm going to first focus on the hot button issue of sex, right? Everybody wants to hear about sex. And of course, when we talk about education and sex, today we include education on gender roles, gender identity, sexual practices, all forms of sexuality, the whole nine yards. And then I'm also going to touch a bit in this talk on teaching surrounding our country's history, and especially our treatment of minorities, blacks in particular, uh, and the rise of so-called critical race theory, or CRT methods. Now, one important point I want to make up front to set the stage is that I do believe there are important distinctions between K through 12 versus higher ed that condition and limit what can be done about let's be frank, the very egregious leftward tilt that has taken over our entire education system. Now before I get into the riveting topic of sex education, I want to convince you why a focus on education is of the most vital importance today for the maintenance of a free, prosperous, and democratic society, and also for anything like a liberal society I, which, as a conservative myself, I say two cheers for liberalism. Such classically liberal societies have, I believe, been heretofore committed to at least tolerating, maybe grudgingly tolerating, if not celebrating, a variety of lifestyles and a broad spectrum of thought. And here, we are very much under threat to reverse that status quo and our education system is in significant part responsible for that threat. So let me read to you from a recent article in National Review, an American magazine, and it's about Britain, not the US, but it's an attempt to explain why so few young people in Britain, even well-off and well-established ones, say they will never vote for the Tory party. They are inveterate lefties, right? You may know the name Eric Kaufman from Burbeck College. He is a very a shrewd, smart political scientist. 
And in a study for the think tank policy exchange, he wrote the following, quote, there is a pronounced liberal national drift among young people, which is related to their indoctrination in schools and colleges with this idea of social justice and critical race theory, as well as gender theory and the unholy trinity of diversity, inclusion, and equity. These ideologies are taught as incontestable facts and manifestly virtuous standpoints rather than as one among several possible interpretations of reality and approaches to history or to governance, which is the way they should be taught. That in turn produces authoritarian moral hostility towards older or politically conservative people who presumably defend all the wrong ideas and practices of the past and may even have participated in them. And he says, of course, what I just said applies not just to Brits, but to young Americans who are unwilling to date conservatives or debate them. Why waste time? Error has no rights. And I think if you were to pick up a phrase that represents the woke ideology that is regnant today in our education system. It is error has no rights, right? So in America, what is going on and what is to be done? Let's start with so-called sex education in the K through 12 system of government sponsored schools, but actually everything I say applies to private schools because there is no escape, right? How sex education is done has emerged as a major battleground in several state systems. And this is not your father or your grandfather's sex education, right? Students are not talking just about the basic mechanics of reproduction and anatomy, but about concepts of gender fluidity, gender choice, transgender options and procedures and they're exposed to a variety of explicit graphic materials on sexual behavior and interactions from a very early age. We're talking about, in some cases, first grade, second grade, third grade. We're talking about little kids here. And what is being fed to them is an ethos of liberation and self-actualization, sexual expression of the polymorphous kind which of course is a central tenet of wokeism. And parents who object or attempt to circumscribe this or opt out of it or to get legislation passed that limits it have met with a huge amount of resistance and that includes name calling, ostracism, informal measures and formal measures, legal rulings in some case cases the courts are on the side of the school system. For example, a Maryland lower court just ruled that parents cannot opt their children out of an LGBTQ set of lessons in the public schools. Now what is to be done? Well, it is my opinion that sex education as it currently exists, right, materials on gender, homosexuality, related topics, should be entirely banned from K through 12 schooling, even through high school. Now, people, that people consider this a radical proposal is in itself a problem. Okay, so now I'm gonna explain uh, why or how that is. Do I really mean banned though? Do I really mean what I'm saying? Well, I would maybe allow very narrowly lessons on the basic anatomy of males and females, basic biology, and then only in high school, although I'm a little bit ambivalent about this because I see what happens when you create these little loopholes. Here I'm referring to the Harvard Affirmative Action case where Chief Justice Roberts at the end says, well, you have to be race blind, but of course that doesn't prevent students from writing essays about their race. Thank you very much. All right. So anyway, but nothing on the psychosocial aspects of sexuality, on gender choice, or on, on sexual behavior, nothing on 
sexual behavior. It has the virtue of simplicity, you have to admit. Now, how would I justify this rule? Because it's so countercultural. First of all, on the pragmatic level, there are other areas of knowledge and intellectual development that are far more important for schools to teach. This is just simple priorities. Teaching and learning time is limited. That's called scarcity. We all know about that. And that time should be used to instruct in the basics of reading, writing, and arithmetic, but also civics, right? How democracies work, our constitutions, the duties of citizenship, the nuts and bolts. All of that is taught very poorly today as reflected in tests of knowledge and skill. Two, second rationale for banning it is that, and this is once again controversial, sex is for adults. We have seen the steady erosion of the line between children and adults on a number of fronts, right, with presentations and exposure to sexual behavior and ideas being an important instance, although it's not the only one. The ideology is get them young when it comes to teaching them about gender and sex and all of the polymorphous topics that are now being introduced. And of course, this flies in the face of traditional notions of childhood innocence on matters of sexuality, which has been a staple of our culture for a very long time until recently. It goes without saying that children are in need of shelter and protection from what they cannot understand and judge, and they lack the maturity to cope with a lot of what is coming their way. To belabor the obvious that children and adults should be treated radically differently in our society, in our education system, just consider all the things that children are not allowed to do. They can't vote, they can't drink, they can't smoke. They're not allowed to work on a factory floor. They can't drive cars, they can't go to war, sign contracts, or give informed sexual consent. That's called statutory rape laws. And they can't be punished the same way as adults are. There is a whole cottage industry on the left dedicated to that proposition. So I say because of these distinctions, there is full authority by the government in running K through 12 systems to decide that certain topics simply will not be part of children's education. Now, not long ago in our country, there was actually a consensus surrounding this proposition. Right? Notions of sexual morality, conventional morality, and respectability prevailed, even though, of course, there were people who deviated from it. But those people, even those people themselves, recognized that they were in some sense marginal, that they existed on the marginal, and that's where they should be. And as a result, once again, I think the government has full authority to banish all this talk of sexuality. The second point I want to make is that we should go back to this notion, and once again it prevailed until very recently, that parents have the prime responsibility for the moral direction of their children. Right? We are talking about moral choices here. There is no society at least in the West, but also I think this is true about the East, that does not put sexual behavior at the center of its moral code. And there is a reason for that. When I say that to students, they're just startled. Wait, sexuality and morality? I mean, do they go together? Because sex, sexual behavior is a prime arena for the exploitation of others involves strong impulses without rules and restraints, people get hurt. And when people get hurt, morality steps in. So sex is inevitably moralized. 
And as a liberal pluralistic society, there is very far from a consensus anymore on moral ideals and notions of proper behavior in the sexual realm. Certainly in America today, there is a vast range of ideas and a properly pluralistic society has to come to some kind of accommodation on moral disagreement, right? Now, the schools think that they can impose a particularly tendentious view of how sex should be regarded, and they pretend that this is objective and scientifically grounded, right, and the purview of experts, but they make the common mistake, which of course is all over our culture, of mixing the factual and the normative, right? The factual and the normative should be strictly separated. Some parents, believe it or not, may regard as sinful the practice of premarital sex or abortion or even birth control, homosexual activity and marriage, or even divorce. And they don't want their children exposed to these concepts or to any presentation that implies that they are acceptable and morally neutral options. But this doesn't have to be grounded in religious belief. There are some parents who might simply disapprove of certain behaviors or find them ill-advised or rank them as less desirable and they don't want the schools working at cross purposes to their attempts to inculcate their own children with their attitudes and point of view. So I say, let's return to an older set of practices that give parents prime a place and keep sexuality out of the schools. Now, there will be immediate objections to this, right? One common refrain that I hear is teachers object to being censored, quote unquote, or certain materials being banned or purged. Isn't that radically illiberal? With all due respect, these objections are completely baseless. They completely lack merit. And even the vocabulary, censorship, banning, right, is inapt. Why? Why is this a misnomer? Because state, the state, which creates the schools and its subsidiary instruments like the school board, have and should have complete and plenary authority over the schools, which includes the curriculum, what teachers teach, what they say. Teachers regard themselves as professionals and they think the hallmark of professionalism is discretion, freedom, non-censorship, but we need to correct that misunderstanding. They have no rights in regard to what they present to students how they discuss it, the materials and topics addressed. They are employees. They have to do the boss's bidding. And the boss is the government. This is when the government speaks, the schools, and the government gets to say what it wants. Second, teachers will say it's educational malpractice not to inform students about all gender-related topics and inculcate a non-discrimination attitude and equity norms that actually do, on many fronts, prevail in our country's laws and norms. I do concede that. Now, this is, I believe, also a mistake because the basic legal norms, equality before the law, protections from persecution, and of course we can argue about how much protection to accord to various sexual lifestyles, can and do coexist with a range of private attitudes on things like the status of homosexuality and transgenderism. They really are not opposed, and that is one myth that I think the left tries to peddle and needs to be adamantly resisted. Now I'm gonna say something controversial, if I haven't already. 
Even non-religious parents can have good reasons to disapprove of, for example, homosexuality or gay marriage and to strongly prefer that their children not be gay or marry a gay person, right? Shocking. Such preferences, which I think are far more widespread than people would ever admit, okay, can be grounded in the simple desire for their grandchildren to be raised by the mother and father who made them, right? Biologically related family which is a perfectly rational and understandable preference. And there may not be much that parents can do in particular cases, but in others, their influence might move the needle, right? Because gayness is in part, in some instances at least, socially influenced, right? It's not fashionable to say this. In fact, it's downright dangerous and leads to cancellation but I know from talking to people that many people do feel this way. If given a choice, they would choose traditional lifestyles for their children. Now, one of the problems in our country is that conservative politicians and opinion leaders have an extremely hard time saying stuff like this, right? They refuse to push back against the lefty orthodoxy, which of course has gone through, has marched through the institutions and taken over most of them. And they don't understand that what the rank and file really think and feel. And I think this is a signal defect of the right. They are afraid of the left. Now, another argument you will hear Teachers and other critics on the left will also say it is a delusion to think that facts and values can be separated in the sphere of educating students on virtually any subject, and unless it's something very quantitative and cut and dried, but even the CRT people tell us that that's imbued with whiteness, which, you know, is a norm, right? Now, I'm not going to deny that. I think that education at bottom is normative in the sense that one has to make choices, right? And those choices will reflect certain points of view and, in many cases, political points of view. I think a better example, or another example, and I'm going to leave sex education for a moment, is the battleground that surrounds how history should be taught in the United States. Now, unlike sex, which can be banished very easily from the curriculum, just don't talk about it, it's much harder to banish history because that's a vital subject for our students to know. But in presenting that subject, neutrality and balance ought to be the goal, right? How do you get neutrality and balance as a practical matter, it's very difficult because demography is destiny. The demography of the teacher corps is far, far left. So the efforts ought to be made to bring in a broader spectrum of views in the individuals who actually present the material, right? And then our students would hear, for example, that our founders were both saints and sinners heroes and vil uh, villains, admirable in many ways, and it would come down to giving Western Civ its due, which is not even close to the way that history is taught today. Right? So that, I think, ought to be our aim. Let me illustrate in the history context before I return to sex how deep the problem is in ideological tilt and lack of balance in the way basic subjects are taught in the United States today. Here's a close to home anecdote. Recently, the board of a suburban Philadelphia school di district over the opposition of the teachers union and other officials voted to solicit a new history curriculum from a man with ties to Hillsdale College, which is a traditional uh, college out in the Midwest. 
And when he produced the curriculum, the teachers immediately whined and complained in hyper-emotional terms to the school board that they were completely stressed by having to master these materials. What materials are we talking about? And this was reported in a local newspaper. We have never before taught the Constitution. We haven't had to teach the American Revolution, the Civil War, Abraham Lincoln. How can we get up to speed on these over the summer? This is a vast job. Now, you can't make this stuff up. Right? What have they been teaching? As a friend of mine suggested, they probably went straight to Rosa Parks and civil rights, although I know they also teach about slavery ad nauseum. It is safe to say that something is very wrong if fifth grade teachers are unequipped to teach children the basics of the American Constitution, and that is what we are dealing with in the United States today. Now, returning to the topic of sex education, I readily admit that banning sex education sounds a lot easier than it is. Right? We'd have to write legislation, or the banners would have to capture the school boards. A number of states have tried to pass legislation, some of it very ham-handed. Florida has a parental bill of rights called Don't Say Gay, and Georgia forbids teaching quote unquote divisive and partisan topics, whatever that means. These are very vague locutions. It's a lot harder than it looks to draft legislation and draft rules for staying away from divisive topics or bringing balance to essential topics, right? But whether it is actually possible to adopt more traditional teaching methods by hook or by crook, by rules or by convention, I think it is. And as the old joke says, I've seen it done. And if you've seen it done, you believe it can be done. And here I am a proud reactionary. I look to the past for our guide. That's something else that's forbidden in the United States, is praising the 1950s. I went to a public school in upstate New York in the 1950s and 1960s, and look how well I turned out. The attitude towards sexual topics was bare minimum to the point of non-existence. I learned in brief home economics units about basic female anatomy, puberty and menstruation. No one ever mentioned sexual intercourse the whole time that I was in public school from kindergarten to senior in high school, right? No one taught us about the penis. Homosexuality wasn't mentioned at all. I learned how babies were made from my friend Bonnie Samansky, and by reading, I was probably 13 or 14 when I figured that out. Here's the interesting thing. Students, teachers, parents, administrators just understood implicitly they didn't have to be told that these were not appropriate subjects to bring up or address. They were taboo, and hooray for taboos. And violations of that taboo would meet with immediate alarm and disapproval in my school district in upstate New York. If a student did ask questions about these things, he would have immediately been told, go talk to your parents. That would be the response. Now, that just sounds so easy. I mean, you don't even need a rule, legislation. You don't have to pass a law. Not only did everyone understand it, but it worked. And it prevailed up to high school. Moreover, it didn't prevent us from reading Romeo and Juliet or novels by Thomas Hardy that alluded to sexual mishaps. It was just understood it's not the school's job to expound on some mis such mishaps beside just exposing us to the great literature. 
Now, my back to the 50s idea has met with great resistance to the people from the people that I presented it to. All right, so let's take my son, 28 years old, who is actually very sympathetic to traditionalist positions, is alarmed by recent developments. He says, Mom, times have changed. Hey, this is not possible. Number one, there is no longer a consensus on these matters. Well, to me, that's a reason to keep sex out, as I expounded uh, earlier in my talk, right? And is the role of teachers to educate us, and most people believe that sexual education is essential to being a knowledgeable adult, right? Well, I don't know what to say to that. Oh, he also adds, Mom, there's the internet. There's exposure on a scale that you cannot possibly imagine. You really cannot keep this stuff away from kids. OK, you can't keep this stuff away from kids, but that doesn't mean that you shouldn't keep this stuff away from kids in the school. right? Now, let me add that although I have gotten pushback and I think it's very difficult to enforce this from above because it's a culture conf, right? That is what it really boils down to, is winning hearts and minds. That I'm going to make a partisan statement. I favor Ron DeSantis as a presidential candidate despite his rotten personality because he is one of the few Republican politicians who understands the importance to our country's future of what is happening in the educational system, how young minds are being influenced by the stranglehold of the far left. And one path forward, I think, in getting this status quo overturned is to try and raise Republican politicians' consciousness of how important it is to bring some kind of balance, at least, or banishment, at best, to our school system. Now, this brings me to the question of what to do about higher education. In my view, the principles and limitations that apply to lower ed, which is plenary authority, just needs to be exercised, that's all, but it is there is not present for higher ed. We are essentially dealing with adults. So the authority to control what they see and hear and are exposed to is going to be circumscribed, although I will admit that the extent to which it is circumscribed is highly contestable. The purposes of higher ed, although overlapping with K-12, are somewhat different. Yes, we want to pass on our cultural legacy. We want to foster an appreciation of its strong points. We want to generate new knowledge. But we also want to promote a sophisticated set of thinking skills that enables people to independently question, assess, evaluate facts, positions, norms. And I think that is something that is distinctly less important at the K through 12 level. And that, in that regard, I am. Uh, you know, at odds with a lot of people who control the education system. The second reason that it's difficult to bring balance to higher ed, which of course has been completely taken over by the far left, is that there are these norms and institutional practices that have developed practices of independence, of free expression, of self-government, that conservatives should be concerned to preserve. I think that uh, if we are too intrusive into higher ed, at the end of the day, that does not concern conservatives or it does not promote conservative interests. Right? In the higher ed sphere, things are complicated by the fact that we have both public and private institutions. Right? In the United States system, the First Amendment to the Federal Constitution supplies an elaborate set of rules to protect adults in public institutions. But 
supposedly the state that creates those institutions and funds them, has a good deal of authority in deciding what will be taught. Private institutions are not limited by the First Amendment, and the government has much less authority to delve into and regulate private institutions. All right. That, I think, once again, is something that conservatives should attempt to preserve, if at all possible. But that doesn't mean that nothing can be done. Here are a few ideas, and I welcome any others. The first and foremost strategy is follow the money. What do I mean by that? Virtually all American universities, public and private, get tons of money from the federal government for various initiatives and programs and you know stuff like that, one billion each to the Ivies, according to the American Enterprise Institute. That is big bucks. And of course, state universities are funded directly by taxpayer dollars. The federal government has already used its spending power, not very effectively to be sure, to bar discrimination by race, sex, and other categories in university receiving, receiving federal funds. That's called the Civil Rights Act. It's Title VI of the Civil Rights Act. That power can be deployed more extensively to get rid of the worst rope excesses. For example, Congress could say that Free speech protections, First Amendment protections, must be accorded by private institutions like Harvard or Yale if they want to get federal funds. Or they can say federal funds are only forthcoming if these schools abolish DIE bureaucracies, reduce the number of administrative personnel, limit the ratios of administrative to teaching spots, ban DEI statements, all of that sort of thing. right? Some initiatives like this have already moved forward at the state level. But the problem, of course, is that those provisions need enforcement. Enforcement is where the rubber meets the road. A Republican administration needs to make enforcing these strictures with the lever of the spending power a top priority and they have not done so yet. The Trump administration is a case in point. Now, Trump was beleaguered on all sorts of levels, and he wasn't someone to sort of stick to the last on these sorts of goals, but I know the person who was his civil rights head, and he was gung-ho to place these limitations on educational institutions. He was subverted by inattention from his rank and file, the Education Department, which has been thoroughly infiltrated by lefties and wokeistas, right? So he didn't get very far. As long as Democrats in power are in power, nothing will happen. Things will always get worse, okay? We need to get Republicans in power and we need to impress them with the seriousness of the problem. And finally, we need to show them that because they're funneling so much money to these colleges and universities, they have a lot more leverage than they have ever used before. Right? And this extends not just to controlling the propagandizing of gender, but also to everything that is being taught about race, about the evil nature of our country, about the deficit of whiteness, and all of these propaganda elements that are front and center. Finally, and I'll just leave you with this thought, Republicans must not be afraid to defend unequal results, and they have to resist the call to rectify them. What do I mean by this? Well, the heart and soul of wokeness is actually not gender, although that's a huge battleground. It is race. Right? The fundamental tenet of the DEI acolytes 
of the professoriate that goes along with it and the HR establishment is that any inequality by race, and here, of course, let's be frank, we're talking primarily about blacks, right? Any inequalities by race, any disadvantage, any gaps is due to racism. Never due to behavior, to choices, to the characteristics of different populations. That is not allowed to be put forward even by Republicans, they're terrified of it. Unfortunately, wokeness will not be vanquished until our leaders, and not just our elected leaders, but the leaders of our institutions, are willing to come right out and say, unequal, rights, uh, unequal results are to be expected, and we should not be expending resources in eradicating them. Thank you. That's all I'm going to say because I want to leave some time here. So here in British Columbia, um, a new requirement I think just passed last year for uh, high school graduation. And for those who don't know, uh, all high school students are required to take an Indigenous Studies course before they're allowed to graduate. Um, given this, what, what are your thoughts on how um, indigenous issues are being taught in uh, schools here in Canada and in, in the U.S. today? Well, <clears throat> I'm such a traditionalist that I would not favor such a requirement. First of all, just you know, going back to the original objections to multiculturalism uh, as an approach to, approach to education, History, the history of Canada, I assume, you know, that's what gets taught since you're in Canada, uh, would necessarily include information about indigenous people and the way that, you know, the immigrants from Europe interacted with indigenous people. That information is going to be there, right? It's going to be presented and it needs to be presented in a very balanced way with a spectrum of ideas about the relationship of you know, the European conquerors to the indigenous peoples. Now, I understand it's not a pretty history. But when you carve out a specific requirement and course of study, it's necessarily going to be taken over by you know, anti Western Civ, anti-white, anti-European ideologues. So that I would, you know, I would work very hard to get rid of that requirement. Hi. <laughs> For the very reasons I've stated. It's already being taught and it'll be taught, you know, in an activist way. Hi, I'd like to uh, suggest a, uh, a change in the next time you uh, give this talk. Instead of the word resolved, sex education should be abolished. Uh, it should be the case for abolishing sex education. Why this change? Well, you did say that parents should have the right to uh, bring up their children the way they want to, but they're awoke parents. Well, and, of course, I, the, I don't deny that. And, and, the and let them let them you know get out of the library books about you know two mommies every night and read them to kids. You're not going to stop them doing that. No, no, no. But I, I think the problem is public education, which means a one size fits all. So I, I think the key is to have uh, get rid of all public education, and then you just have private education, and then the people uh, the people who are woke. In their private schools, they can teach about uh, whatever they want. And uh, ordinary people, uh, folks like us, uh, would go to private schools that don't have that sort of sex education. Uh, whereas the way you're putting it, it it's sort of a one size fits all. Namely, uh, namely uh, we should do things uh, the conservative way. But um, I, I think it would be much better to, to adopt, say, a more libertarian viewpoint, 
which would allow satisfaction in schools for both sides. And, and the people shouldn't just be confined to uh, telling them about two mommies uh, privately. That They should learn on, about that in school if that's what they want. And, and I had another comment, and that is, we got to stop the, the black-white gap in basketball. <laughs> it, 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 this is due to racism, obviously. <laughs> I'm kidding, of course. This is a reductio ad absurdum. Well, it's okay if you favor blacks. That's, no, that's I'm, sort I'm, of a fundamental precept I'm, in the United States. I'm, I'm kidding you know. about that. It's a yeah. reductio ad absurdum. That, well, let uh, me comment on the schools. Sure. I mean, you know, in all these topics, there's kind of an approach in theory at a very high level of discourse, and then there's the reality on the ground. And the two often do not meet up, right? So in the United States, the premise of my talk is there will be public education. But of course, that's not mandatory. Uh, we could have a totally new regime where public we just abolish the public schools. That's not going to happen anytime soon. But this, the more important observation is that we already in the United States have a robust system of private education, K through 12 schools. And you know, for reasons that I think need to be thought about uh, and, and understood, and I don't completely understand, they are a monolith too. I mean, trying to get a traditionalist type school going that you know is reactionary in all the best ways, goes back to the 50s, you know, it's, it's very, these, there are very, very few schools like that. I, I can think of one uh, near Philadelphia, the Mainline Academy, and the way that they've done it is by they, they've hired a teacher corps of uh, Russian immigrants who all know each other and they're all on the same page and they're willing to teach certain materials in certain ways. But even in private schools, you're drawing from the teacher corps. And the teacher corps is a captured population. You know, it's a bunch of of women with blue hair and nose rings. I mean, you know, this is not an exaggeration. Oh, you don't, oh, right. Well, I'm talking about the United States. <laughs> I'm not saying everyone. I, I, yeah, I, I'm not, when I generalize, I don't mean every single person. That's a straw man. But if you see who's going to the ed schools, who's graduating from the ed schools, and what their politics is and what their attitudes are, then if you're using those teachers, it's very, very hard to get a well-disciplined traditional school going. It shouldn't be that way. It shouldn't be that way. Um, I mean, my, uh, my two daughters, I also have a son who refused to go, but my two daughters went to a very, very fancy boarding school, Phillips Andover Academy, which, you know, costs a bloody fortune. As my daughter said, my, it's like buying a new BMW every year and then driving it over a cliff. Uh, that's how she described her education at Andover. Um, Andover is the wokest place you could ever imagine. And they're all like that. So I, you know, how do we change that? I really don't know. Now, homeschooling is the ultimate exit option, right? And there's a tremendous amount of homeschooling going on. And more and more, I, parents, I know parents of little kids or elementary school age kids, and they are terrified of the system. They really don't know where to turn. A lot of them are very high power professionals, so homeschooling is going to be a challenge for them. My husband and I, who have you know 20 and 30 something kids, we often say, what if we had little kids today? What would we do? And there's no obvious answer. OK. So first of all, on the topic of uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion, <laughs> I can't remember who said it, but free men are not equal, and equal men are not free. And my question is. I'll remember that. That's true, but you know, try teaching kids that. That's and on the, not allowed. The topic of the speech, uh, can you see any downside to the complete elimination of federal departments of education? No. Uh, I think, well, 
I'm in favor of eliminating the Department of Education. The reason that's hard and, and not going to happen uh, is that the Department of Education administers all of these, this proliferation of programs and scholarships and, you know, uh, Title I, which gives extra money to schools that educate disadvantaged kids, Pell Grants, which are government-sponsored loans for higher ed. I mean, there's all sorts of administrative functions pursuant to legislation that are Congress has passed, unfortunately, that is reposed in the Department of Education. Now, one could take those functions and, you know, spread them out among other, uh, other administrative bodies and the like, um, but it would require a, an incredible act of will and boldness to do that. I mean, I don't even think DeSantis, you know, who's pretty, pretty bold and based about what's going on, would even have the courage to do it. Let me just add one thing, and I'm, I am going on too long here in these answers. We have in the United States a vast federal bureaucracy, I'm sure you have it in Canada too, and a deep state of people working in that bureaucracy that when a new administration comes in, this was true of the Trump administration, I just heard a lecture about this, their mission is to foil every single attempt to change things. And of course, they know how the system works. And they work it like crazy. Uh, and they will derail all of this stuff. So um, you can be for it, but that doesn't give you a blueprint about how to implement it. Uh, I just want to say thank you for coming and speaking today. And uh, it's a very important topic. Um, we have Max Bernier, who is in our midst, who is basically the only person in Canada in any government status that is speaking out or for your topic and saying enough of this. So thank you, Max, for being here. He's speaking later. <laughs> um, but I, I just, you covered off a couple of questions that I had, but the level to, uh, the extent of the level that it has infiltrated the systems mm -hmm. is mind boggling. And how is it that, con I think because I'm a conservative person and have been a traditionalist person and brought up so, so is it the lack of um, back into this morality? I mean, is spirituality has been missing from the schools. They've you know, taken out. When's the last time you heard the Ten Commandments? We all grew up by it. I mean, you know, are these things so inherently out of touch now with people that there is really no hope to go back? I mean, how do we get people speaking out and being... Um, because when I talk to the kids, a lot of kids, they feel this way. They have natural inherent rights that they want to speak about, but they feel very limited. Mm -hmm. And so how does that get brought forward? Mm -hmm. Where is the solution here? Well, I, it's very complicated, but I, in hearing you uh, ask this question, I realized that I think one place it started to fall apart was in the attitude about the role of the school vis-a-vis -vis parents. This kind of mistrust and this benign paternalism, or initially well-meaning paternalism, crept into the way the government regarded parents and parental authority. And that's because they don't trust parents. They say, oh, parents are not going to inform their kids about sexuality or sexual transmitted diseases or, you know, even basic reproduction or sexual intercourse. Well, yeah, I'm, a, I'm proof of that, right? My parents never taught me that stuff. My parents were excellent parents, but they never taught me that stuff. So that's a dereliction. We have to do something about that. We have to step in and compensate for parental incompetence and uh, parental neglect and, and all of that. So once you do that, you're now 
you know, blurring this line, very strong line, or this convention that parents have, you know, the first most important right to direct the upbringing of their children, and especially in matters of morality, right? So what they also did, the schools, is say, this is not morality. This is just basic knowledge, basic science. We have to teach students about what's going on in society, about sexuality, and then, of course, this dogma, and it's pure dogma, that if we teach them about birth control and about sex, they will behave better, which, I mean, there's absolutely no basis for, for thinking that, right, if we just give them the facts. So all of those ideologies, uh, you know, the, which are very modern and very hip and thought to be very forward-thinking, have given the schools permission to tread where they never dared tread before. And frankly, I think emphasizing that has worked in the United States. Parents getting up at school board meetings, and there's been more and more of this going on, and saying, you are undermining our authority. That is our real objection. You know, we want to be able to direct our children's upbringing. Maybe it won't and will work, and maybe it won't work. I think parents understand that. But we don't want you working at cross purposes to us. I mean, take a slight different tack. My first job out of college was I was a high school teacher, and I taught in an upper middle class school. And what I found in general when I saw trouble kid, and I met the parents, I understood the connection. You know, it wasn't 100%, but usually troubled kid, troubled parents. The next year, I taught in a ghetto school. That I could talk about for hours. Forget parenting. It was just chaotic. And what I find today, at least in the United States, 40% of women are having a child with no father. And if you look by race, 72% of African Americans come from a single parent, and Latinos, 50%. There is the lack of relationships in family. That, to me, is a very important part of education, and, and we're losing that. I, you can have the greatest schools, but if we don't have loving parents, I don't know how the system can possibly work. Right, and that's another reason why the school district steps in and why the government steps in, because they see, you know, because of, you know, the kind, now I'm going to go rap on the 60s, because of the liberationist ethos of the 60s, which of course has hit the lower uh, SES groups the hardest demographically, um, parents are not doing their job as well as they should. But here's the thing, and this also is another normative judgment an ideology, if you will, there is this idea that the government can substitute for parents, can step in and play the role. And I think that idea has to be adamantly resisted. No, the government cannot substitute for a father. The government cannot substitute for a family. They can maybe mitigate some of the harms in a mild kind of way, but to take over the function. And it's hard to convince people of that because you are victimizing innocent children who didn't ask to be born into dysfunctional families or to single mothers or whatever. Society has promoted single motherhood. It has, you know, dumped on marriage. It has denigrated conventional morality and bourgeois values. You know, they have contributed to the situation. So I would, that's a whole other discussion. I would try and stop that. Whether it'll do any good or not, I don't know. But... It, I, I acknowledge what you're saying, absolutely. I mean, I, I see my fellow upper middle class parents and I just cringe, even at the way that they're raising their children. It would not be my way. But of course, I'm considered, my kids make fun of me because you know they say that I'm something out of another era or whatever. Uh, I'm old school, yes, very old school. Hi. <clears throat> I'd like to characterize what I get out of this as not just a topic on or teaching on sex education or critical race theory, but on the view of some teachers, obviously not those who are in this room, 
that they own access to your children. Mm -hmm. And the thing that these topics, um, indigenous rights as presented from certain points of view and so on, is that they are ones we are not allowed to talk about, we are told, where you don't platform the error or wrongness. And so if these conversations were about sex ed alone, and they got a bunch of parents in a room, I'm sure we wouldn't need to ban the topic because there's things that we all think children should know. Like, you might be getting a period soon, right. and you should know how this works. But we are purposefully cut out of those discussions and thus given only one choice. Take it the way it's being presented by someone who obviously will not cooperate, or to uh, say no altogether. Mm -hmm. And this seems more like a coordinated attack on all Western values, for instance, than just sex ed. Sure. And it reminds me of the quote of, uh, from Hannah Ardent, the idea sub ideal subject of totalitarian rule is not the convinced Nazi or convinced communist, but people for whom the distinction between fact and fiction and the distinction between true and false, i.e. the standards of thought, no longer exist. Right. Does no, any of that? I mean, I totally agree with you, but there is a wholesale attack on Western Civ and, you know, our schools to the point where it's considered inappropriate to raise, uh, to, to expose kids to all of the accomplishments and achievements of dead white males. I mean, that, we're, we're really at that point now where that is considered a right-wing priority uh, to give them you know, the full picture. I mean, we could spend a ton of time in school talking about the achievements and accomplishments and glories of Western Civ, which of course are all around us. Uh, but you know, I, I did an interview with Glenn Lowry uh, Brown, and I love him, and he's great, right? But he said something to me very telling. I said, I think that our students should be taught about the achievements and glories of Western Civ because they are there and they enjoy the fruits of that every day and we're trying to promote gratitude, which is of course a normative concept, right? Because I think that's good for the country. Um, and he said, well, that's so chauvinistic. Chauvinistic. I went and looked up chauvinistic in the dictionary because this is an example of how the lefties manipulate you by choosing certain vocabulary. It means excessively proud, excessively self regard That word excessively, right? That's where the rubber meets the road on value judgments, their values, not our values. Who's to say what degree of pride in the glories of Western Civ is excessive? I say, you know, complete silence on it is the worst possible way to present it. I mean, we are not even exposing our kids to um, a lot of just pure information. I reject excessively, see. But anyway, um, yes, I agree that the teachers think that we are errant, right? As, as Kaufman said, they refuse to date conservatives or debate them. We have to rescue kids from these horrible, backward, reactionary, uh, derelict parents. It's not just dereliction, as you, are, uh, as you described, but backwardness, right? We are backward. <laughs> Great, uh, thank you, Dr. Wax. Um,